Good evening, everyone. Uh, thank you for coming. It's really been a pleasure. I mean, I've only been here half a day, and it's been a great pleasure. I'm really, really happy and excited. And uh, I received a very warm hospitality, and I'm grateful for that, both to the students I've met and to Professor Moledina. And well, coming from the Fighting Irish and joining the Fighting Scots for <laughs> one night, it just uh, I do feel uh, at home. And um, yeah, um, if you are you know curious about uh, the way I kind of see my own work, if I really have to define myself and categorize myself, I am a um, political anthropologist, meaning both that I pay a lot of attention to uh, politics and institutions and issues of power, but also arguably that you know whatever I say has a lot of political nuances or. Uh, implications, uh, as hopefully you will agree. And I do pay a lot of attention to, well, mobility, mobility, uh, sovereignty, democracy, human rights, uh, especially, you know, at this turn uh, of the 21st century. And it's never too early to thank uh, everyone who has made this possible. Um, Amias and again everyone for the institutional support and warm reception and hospitality. So um, and again I, I will go um, more or less deep but uh, I do want to keep time for Q&A and I am looking forward to, to that indeed. I always start with this slide. Uh, well the piece of art uh, I will come back to it but to me it does convey something about international relations uh, and uh, issues of power and negotiation and leverage. And this one, I just, you know, pretty random, caught it in, in Berlin, in Germany. It does convey something about international relations when uh, governments uh, who are responsible for many, many, many millions of refugees uh, use refugees pretty much as a threat. Uh, you know, Russia, this hour, uh, this past weekend, saying, "Well, you risk uh, a new flood of refugees if you, you know, bomb Syria or something like that." Arguably, President Erdogan of Turkey uh, can do this with not only Germany but really Ch uh, Chancellor Merkel, but the rest of Europe. But beyond that, um, you know, this is really a very basic starting point. Uh, Turkey, among other countries, hosting, uh, you know, conservative figure. 3 million, uh, at the very least, 3 million Syrian refugees plus nationals of Afghanistan and Iraq. Um, and then if you look at the you know, global list of countries hosting refugees in absolute numbers, uh, not relative to the population, uh, but in absolute numbers, so it's Tur Turkey, Pakistan, Lebanon, Iran, Uganda, Ethiopia, and you know, you, don't, you do have to go bit down in this ranking to come to Germany, Sweden, the US, uh, even Canada, Italy, which is what I will be focusing on a little bit. And so this slide really kind of encompasses a bit of my conclusion uh, of my own work and as a premise for everything I will be saying um, today. So I do argue that the right to seek asylum in you know, for the sake of time, the global north, it's not really a right anymore. Uh, it is a right if you look at the Universal Declaration of Human Rights, if I'm not mistaken, Article 14. If you look at the uh, European, you know, fundamental, right, fundamental charter of rights of the European Union, even national constitutions, such as the Italian one, they do recognize the right to seek asylum, which is not the right to get asylum or to be recognized as a refugee, but the right to seek asylum. Well, you really cannot get to the right without paying smugglers uh, or without risking your life. And 90% on average, or last handful of years, five years or so, 90% of all refugee arrivals and more generally migrant arrivals uh, through the Mediterranean into Europe, uh, or better, the European Union, uh, arrive through facilitation services, through smuggler services, by paying uh, smuggl smugglers, essentially, uh, pretty obviously, because there's really no other route. There is no other venue available, no embassies, no consulates, no remote application. Um, 
um, other than you know staying in Lebanon or Jordan or, or et cetera, et cetera. So again, uh, right to seek asylum, I do argue it is a commodity that can be bought or you can have access to that com commodity only at the great, at the great human and financial cost. And indeed, even if you get to Europe, uh, it's a favor, it's a sovereign favor that is, that is granted through discretion. What interests me, and I think what should be interesting, um, is that, well, not only this is an actively perpetuated inequality in the global responsibility toward refugees, meaning that, well, Europe is ready to give 6 billion euros to the Turkish government in order to ideally and hopefully mitigate the circumstances of Syrian refugees there. But so Europeans are happier about giving 6 billion euros than resettling or receiving or assisting or integrating people using, let's say, the same amount of money. And this is, again, there is a clear objective. The objective is to keep this inequality in the global responsibility to refugees uh, as an inequality, as a you know pretty substantial um, uh, asymmetry. So again, kind of my book, I do argue that this system can be perpetuated only through these kind of gray areas between authoritarianism and democracy. Turkish government right now, you know, does not strike us as particularly democratic or liberal, for example, but also countries such as, you know, Niger, uh, or indeed coming to terms with Libyan authorities, which are not really authorities, they are militias and uh, smugglers themselves. Um, I do speak of mobile borders in, in some articles and even indirectly be in my own book. Um, I do argue, and I'll do that you know, very briefly toward the end of the presentation, I do it more substantially in a very little uh, book in Italian, which I regret not having brought, and so I could have given it to the only Italian <laughs> student uh, on campus, Marco, but uh, you know, uh, this doesn't have to be the case. In other words, crimes of peace is what I focus on, what I find, you know, uh, that is going on in the world, and in particular in the European and Mediterranean context, but it doesn't have to be the way, and not just on moral terms, but as far as I'm concerned, on you know empirical, pragmatic, uh, realistic terms, and also with considerations having to do with citizenship and equality. And so I am beginning to conceptualize this idea of migrant uh, democracy. So uh, it is necessary, I believe, to define borders a little bit, especially because I do not mean borders as they, ma they are, you know, understood, for example, in international relations or, or um, you know, from a geopolitical point of view. And I think there are, there are also a lot of uh, not only analytical, but also political implications. So if you're looking into, you know, ways forward to challenge borders, then, okay, we need to understand what a border is. And so um, that's you know that comes close to to my own understanding of borders. And to you know briefly make sense of the slide, the port of Palermo, uh, Sicily, it is pretty obvious that you know if you are an Italian citizen or a citizen of any European Union country, get on the ferry. Uh, you can travel to Tunis, Tunisia, North Africa, West Africa, pretty freely. I mean, you do pay the ticket, you get on board, you get there. Is the other way around possible? Can you travel as a tourist from Tunisia or West Africa or North Africa uh, and just you know visit Italy or study in the European Union? So obviously you're not. So you know there is a certain direction or directionality um, to this mobility, and also there is uh, indeed not you know. Uh, not a lot of Italians are, uh, or Europeans are um, familiar with the history of colonialism. You know, we are familiar with maybe British, Belgium, Belgian, French uh, colonial history, but you know, the border was open uh, historically for colonialism, right, from the north to the south. And what I found striking about this, it's from a, uh, an exhibit in Italy this past summer, 
when Italian authorities, uh, when they got to Libya, which is roughly a century, slightly more than a century ago, they started writing, you know, books or little booklets about climatology, like the weather of Tripoli and Benghazi, and then, you know, aspects of uh, botanical and um, agricultural uh, aspects uh, of Libya. So even th that knowledge about Libya, the weather, the climate, the agriculture was not purely technical. Does do we ever, you know, produce knowledge that is just purely technical? This was part of the colonial enterprise. And so this pretty, um, you know, dense, but it again comes close to what I mean by borders. Uh, so you can just read the top part, uh, which is an excerpt of my own book, uh, Crimes of Peace. But then, uh, I, you know, I've, I was lucky to work with this scholar, Angela Naimo, and she's in literature, so she obviously has a way with words. And in introducing the special issue of the journal Humanity, which I'm, I'm afraid is not open access, but well, we are at a college and the introduction by Angela is open access, so you can actually uh, read it. So in introducing kind of my own contribution to that special issue, she, she really encapsulates uh, my understanding, ironically, of the border, that the one at the bottom is a border that you know, follows people, that envelops people, uh, that is also uh, a social boundary um, of belonging, of acceptance, even you know, when you make it alive uh, across uh, the Euro-Mediterranean border. So what I'm going to do over the next few minutes is give you a sense from you know, the south to the north, uh, from Africa into Europe, uh, of mobility and immobility and the various um, you know, obstacles and, and negotiations that happen on these uh, so-called uh, routes. Oops. And I'm going to use a couple of uh, pieces of uh, art that I came across uh, recently in Palermo again in Sicily. And this piece of art by Francesco Piobig is titled, um, uh, well in translation, Oil Goes Through uh, we don't, right? Uh, I guess we start to see some parallels here, uh, obviously, with you know relationships between North uh, U.S. and Central America. Um, by the way, and I can come back maybe in the Q and A uh, to okay, who's we? Who are these people in terms of demography, in terms of uh, age or gender or um, uh, countries of origin, uh, trying to get through uh, this border? But, you know, as Ami has just said, it's not just people, right? Um, it's, and it's not just oil. Uh, we know about oil and Libya, for example, but it's also gas. Uh, it's uranium in Niger, Ni Niger, for example. Oil, you know, it could be Nigeria. It could be gas, uh, Algeria, ura uranium. There is land in terms of land grabbing by... European, but more broadly multinational corporations. Uh, there is water issues. Uh, there is even f intensive industrial lies fishing off the coast of West Africa by European vessels and Chinese vessels uh, pretty directly, and we have seen this ethnographically, um, uh, off the coast of uh, Ghana, for example. And then, what a surprise, some of those same fishermen become smugglers and you know are driving those boats uh, across the Mediterranean. Uh, I should mention, I forgot to mention, uh, I haven't been to Ghana by myself, I, relying on the scholarship of a colleague, but you know I have been to a couple of countries in North Africa, including Libya and Tunisia, and they do receive, also Algeria, they do receive lots of plastic uh, on their own coast, and they do, are, and they are suffering, as in Sicily and elsewhere. Uh, and so, you know, it's not too surprising then that they sell the boat uh, to smugglers to make a profit or they actually drive these boats themselves. Uh, you know, Italian olive oil, well, very often is also Tunisian olive oil, but, you know, not paid at the same price, pretty obviously, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. So definitely, you know, kind of a lack of sync between the mobility of resources, whether natural or uh, other kind of resources, and the Constrain, much more constrained and less liberalized mobility when it comes to people. I guess that's pretty obvious. But maybe less obvious that there is also a north to south mobility 
of a lot of different um, institutions and uh, projects and ways to deal with the southern shore and African sh part of uh, the system uh, that are pretty asymmetrical. So here, um, it's again another piece of art by the same um, artist. And uh, this kind of Italian acronyms, I mean, you are obviously familiar with NATO, maybe with Shell, the global oil company, FMI, it's uh, IMF. So, you know, this idea that the movement of people is not just a spontaneous or unmotivated, but that there are, you know, more global forces behind the mobility. Of course, you have to make sense of this also ethnographically, right, in the case of actual, you know, individuals. Okay, how does it look like? Why do they decide or have to uh, emigrate? But again, from, from um, north to south, there is a lot of that going on, which again, uh, I try to, to pin down. And, um, you know, if you if you're not sure about career plans after graduation, well, you can go into border technology and, you know, ca building camps and kind of camps infrastructure. The sector is going pretty uh, substantially uh, projected plus 8% 8, 8 as a growth uh, per year over the last few years, specifically in terms of European projects in Africa. So essentially trying to have all African countries implement uh, technologies in terms of smart passports and border technology with the ultimate objective of keeping as many people in and keeping in third country nationals, meaning not, not even their own citizens, but you know, uh, of refugees or other African citizens and conditional aid. So conditional upon complying with this pressure coming from the European Union or individual um, European countries such as Italy, uh, but not only Italy, uh, asking these governments, uh, okay, keep people in, comply with the border technology, erect the fence or buy our own technology to patrol the borders, to surveil, all of that, and we'll give you aid or we'll give you some visa waiver. Uh, it's for your own citizens. So again, the issue with this is not about morality, but can you really do this kind of you know, negotiation with other countries that do not really have a government? So you're arguably dealing with militias and you know, informal groups, or can you do this with countries such as Niger, um, uh, which you know, I did ask a co my colleague who was in Niger, so should I speak of Niger as a you know semi-authoritarian country? And he said, he's really doing a lot of work there, he said, drop the semi, it's an authoritarian country. So when you give money to these authoritarian governments, where's the money going? Uh, what is it doing? Is it curbing refugees? Is it generating refugees? Because then the military and police forces in those countries are actually able to, you know, suppress or oppress uh, even their own citizens more effectively. Um, so we're still in Africa, and um, this is again from an exhibit uh, at Notre Dame, and it pretty much captures the, uh, in pretty graphic uh, ways, the condition of people who find themselves uh, stranded or um, have uh, I'll come back to the stranded, but you know, who find themselves kind of stuck or confined in North African countries. In this specific case, we have Eritrean, Eritrean um, nationals in the Sinai, uh, Egypt, but you know, I can guarantee the same is going on uh, in Libya. So here you see exploitation, persecution, torture, harassment, um, smuggling that becomes trafficking. Um, you know, I think everyone came across some CNN footage of the slave market um, in, in Libya. So, um, you know, um, what this, and you know, when you compare what are we doing at 17 and what refugees are doing at 17 and where they are and what they are going through, uh, what he's saying is, I want to stop this punishment against people who are only trying to save their lives. 
I want to show the victims' loved ones that they have not been forgotten. I want to persuade people that these dangerous routes are not worth the risk. I really want to show the international community that this is happening to real people. So here, you know, there are two read two audiences. Um, there is the international community, the ones north of the Mediterranean, but not exclusively, right? Because here we're also part of the international community. Uh, here we could argue, we could see there's some of these going on uh, on Mexican soil, on you know, on the back of Central American migrants. Although Mexico, you could argue at least, is a functioning um, state, uh, but you know, huge issues in terms of drug cartels and some corruption um, and all of that. And you know, we can talk more maybe in the Q and A about this aspect of um, people who do believe in the opportunities Europe has to offer. So the whole, you know, here in the Mediterranean, scholars tend to speak of mixed migration, right? It's, it's a bit more complicated than that, but it is really literally a lot of different nationalities and a lot of different motives ending up on the same boat, both literally and meta metaphorically speaking. So the boat in the Mediterranean, the both as in the detention facilities in Libya, the both, you know, the, 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 the dire conditions of, um, you know, these safe houses or, or uh, ghettos or uh, foyers, a lot of different names uh, for these uh, kind of enclosed facilities where migrants uh, stay uh, with the hope of uh, reaching Europe. Um, and I should mention that um, Libya, and Mexico, by the way. Uh, we think of these as countries of origin, right? People are coming from Libya, people are coming from Mexico. They're neither Libyans nor Mexicans, right? These are transit countries. At the same time, they're also destination countries. So Libya, as an oil-rich country, as a Middle Eastern, North African country, uh, traditionally has been hosting uh, millions of, of migrants, uh, people who want to work there, make a living, and then maybe go back or, or you know, not necessarily having Europe in mind. Uh, obviously, Libya, again, is a, you know, from two different governments to dozens of militias to uh, pockets of Islamic State, Libya is simply not a country where you can envision a future and you are liable to these, to these all the time. Essentially, there's no sense of uh, security and um, so even if you could stay in Libya, you do try uh, um, going north to a degree also because as a migrant, um, again, even if you're not a refugee, if you come from Bangladesh, which believe it or not is often the case, uh, Bangladesh to Libya for work, uh, you work a little bit, then you see that there are not the right conditions there well, you cannot really go back to Bangladesh. And we do come, you know, to something about gender here. It's not feminism necessarily, but it, it, it is the importance of gender norms. You cannot just go back um, as a male, especially, and kind of lose your face and say, yeah, you paid for my trip to Libya. You know, the whole community or the family supported my trip to Libya. I went there and now I'm, a, I'm coming back with nothing in my pockets. You just cannot do it not in West Africa, not in Afghanistan, not in Bangladesh. So essentially you try your, um, uh, your um, well, um, luck by crossing the Mediterranean. And I, I, kind of, I am taking for granted that you are familiar with you know, the, the fact that there are also a lot of uh, refugees in the more strict sense, right? But also, people environmental by, uh, sorry, people displaced by, again, drought, people displaced by lack of access to um, uh, subsistence, or people displaced by corruption. For And for all of these, we don't really have the kind of global legal categories that, you know, define people as a refugee or as an economic migrant. Is it, it is kind of a gray uh, zone, you know, gang violence in Central America, is that a good reason legally to be categorized as a refugee in the US? Not really, and yet they are risking their life and there is no government or authority that is effectively 
capable of ensuring their safety. Uh, but again, legally, uh, even with the forthcoming global compacts on migration and refugees, arguably um, the categories are not large enough to accommodate um, this kind of thing and what people leave behind in their own countries. So we are at sea finally, and here I just um, briefly refer to the um, kind of trajectory of um, somebody who is in their mid to late 20s now, uh, Benjamin, a uh, person from Iranian Kurdistan. So you know that Kurdistan doesn't really exist, of course, as an institutional recognized um, country. But um, he did feel that essentially he was risking his life uh, as a Kurdish person in Iran. And so uh, over several months, or if not years, which is really the norm uh, in this for, for Kurds, Afghanis, and others, um, he made it from, again, Iran to Turkey, then Greece, um, then from Greece on a vessel to Italy, then, of course, by land to France, Belgium, Denmark, which was his intended destination. He was working as a tour guide uh, in Denmark. Then, because of the Dublin regulations, which is essentially if you enter the European Union in any given country, well, that country should be responsible for processing your asylum application or, or immigration case. He was re deported or sent back to Italy. And he describes essentially all of this. Uh, it's the wind that wrote my story which happens to be um, kind of a, an old Iranian Kurdish proverb. But I thought, well, it captures something about how this works. And I think that how this works, how do you navigate, well, mobilities and immobilities, you know, it's not just your agency and how good or entrepreneurial or courageous or whatever you are is also not entirely just, you know, okay, People are just constrained and they have no saying and there's no agency whatsoever. I do think it is a combination of you know structures of structures of power and the border regime and sovereignty and all that and corruption, but also you know the discretion, discretion of smugglers, discretion of uh, state agencies, um, individual agency, and believe it or not, also the circumstance and luck that can really make a difference whether you live or not, whether you are, you know, if you're, again, if you're familiar with the wet feet, dry feet, or wet food, dry food in the U.S., I mean, what is that, right, from Cuba to the U.S., wet food, dry food, I mean, wh who's deciding there? Is it the sea, nature, the coast guard, the winds, the currents, you know, the engine, how, sp so um, I do believe this captures something important. So people finally, uh, you know, arrive in a port, such as in this case, uh, which happens to be my, my hometown, where I grew up in southeastern Italy. And, you know, 796 Ser Syrian refugees on this single cargo vessel. And their message is something like, okay, first of all, we are not being trafficked. Uh, smuggled, it's fine, we paid, and we want you to come, and we're not being coerced, so, and we're not victims. Um, whether they say it explicitly or whether they convey it, it's another conversation, but, you know, collectively, I have been talking and interviewing with a lot of refugees over the years, and that's certainly something that it's important to them. They don't want to be perceived as mere victims. Um, and so, well, okay, if people are not just trafficked, into this, then at some point, as Italians or as US citizens, we need to come to terms with the idea that, okay, they're not being trafficked, or they're not just the victims of smugglers, so then, okay, they actually want to come, or they need to come, because they're refugees, so we need to kind of grapple with that, right? And what I argue in my larger work is that, especially in Italy and bit of the rest of Europe, there's so much emphasis on all these people being smuggled or trafficked victims that, you know, the idea being, okay, you remove the vector of this undocumented mobility, you solve the problem, right? Uh, but obviously, uh, it's a bit more complicated than that. 
and well, yeah, I can speak more to the uh, you know reasons why they left Turkey, um, but essentially they felt they were waiting there for you know in a limbo, and people do, want, especially young males and especially families with children, they feel they need to take you know their own trajectory into their own hands uh, rather than wait, wait, wait in this limbo. And, and so coastal cities or, you know, border cities um, as well in the U.S. Uh, are really interesting points from a research and political point of view um, because on the one hand, coastal cities, border cities are the places where, you know, there's this entanglement of care, food, shelter, but also co coercion, you know, uh, imprisonment and processing aspects. Um, all of that captivity, but having done research in this, these coastal places, and in this case, and many others, you know, having spoken to people, they are also yes, sites of sites of crisis, as in the refugee crisis. But crisis can also be uh, actually etymologically also critical reassessment, right? Critical thinking about okay, what are these people doing here? What do they want? Why did they come using smugglers? And, you know, we are used again to the figure of the victim thanking the rescuing, the rescuers, right? Thank you, thank you, thank you, which is true, which happens a lot. But I spoke, even with, you know, tough skinned police agents who spend the night in this port, uh, assisting, helping, coordinating, and, uh, Believe it or not, some of those police agents were thanking the refugees because, you know, one of them said, well, because they show me, because this four-year-old with her smile show me that you can laugh in life even after you went through hell. And so refugees became this kind of, or become this kind of almost inspirational, uh, you know, figure uh, that motivates people to work. And and that the quote for from Pablo Neruda, uh, you know, aims at, okay, is this embrace really short term, ephemeral, irrelevant? It's just you know redundant, uh, or is it something more long term, both in terms of the critical reassessment and the importance of the reception um, for refugee for refugees? You know, the kind of human uh, and humane uh, reception. So, I, as I said, you know, I, I was going to come back to the stranded. Uh, there are a lot of migrants, refugees. I do realize I haven't really told you, okay, why am I using migrants, refugees, but I'll do that later in the Q&A. But, um, you know, there are a lot of people stranded uh, in Europe right now, not only in Libya and, you know, and Egypt and Tunisia, etc., but also in Europe itself. Europe being uh, uh, the French-Italian border, the Italian-Austrian border, the Greek-Macedonian border, uh, Greek islands, uh, Turkey, pretty obviously. But, you know, it, okay, it's not quite stranded. Uh, it's more like, you know, the engine broke and or, you know, got flat tire and stranded. It's more like, well, governments did erect either electronic or physical or, you know, um, phenotypical typical kind of fancies, meaning that there is profiling. Essentially, here we call it racial or phenotypical profiling. And, you know, there's agents getting on board of trains and, okay, you must be a migrant, you must be a refugee. No, you're, you're fine, you're Italian, you're French. So essentially, again, it's not just open or closed. Uh, you know, it's closed for migrants and refugees. And all of these are intra-European border, even in the sense of intra-European Union. Borders. Um, so, again, uh, it's mobility for some, it's immobility for others. And so, well, in the book, I do pay a lot of attention to the issue of death uh, at sea, which is what got me here, which is what got me to care about all of this, which is my most urgent concern, uh, which also takes 200 pages to discuss. And so, you know, I cannot do it here, but this um, painting refers to 23 
1,000 deaths. Uh, that's both a conservative estimate and a bit out of date. So I would argue with IOM, with the UN Refugee Agency and others, that we have seen some 30,000 people dying or missing at sea over the last 18 years. And so that's there, right? 30,000, some 30,000. Could even be one, as far as I'm concerned, if that one death is not necessary. I think the logic of the argument stays the same. But you know, having said that, then there is the question of alternatives, right? And to me, I do speak of these as, a, as an injustice, as a structural injustice. What is justice? What is injustice? Uh, you know, it can be subjective. It has to do maybe with your whatever religious background or moral conviction or you know your politics. So you know, justice and injustice. But to me, one one piece of criteria is okay if there are alternatives. If at least one of those persons or more could have been either saved or not be put into that condition, well, that's an injustice. So an injustice, it's such an injustice when there is an alternative. And I do believe all of these are alternatives. And you know, I didn't come up with them. It's the IOM, it's the UNHCR, it's different NGOs, it's even some you know, political parties more than others uh, saying, OK, this could be done. This can be done. It's probably less even financially expensive than everything else that has been tried, than paying the authorities of Niger or Libya or all these countries um, to keep people in. Um, so having said all of this, who is doing what? And again, refugees and migrants themselves are doing much to push against the wall. And obviously here there is a reference also to our own wall here. Um, and it's never just a wall. I am convinced that this is mostly propaganda. This is mostly a very narrow, um, you know, seemingly, well, simplistic way to conceptualize the border. So politically you can say I'm doing something about migration. I'm no reference to anyone here, but you know, I am building the fence, I am building the wall, but the real border again is not just the wall, it's all I said, you know, in the first second slide. And indeed, these refugees and these citizens together in Naples are saying, well, the wall is not just you know the physical fence, it's also totalitarianism, dictatorship, hypo hypocrisy, um, the lack of solidarity. Um, hunger, ignorance, um, Islamophobia, organized crime, um, bullism, uh, hypocrisy, etc., cetera, um, et cetera. Um, And, you know, look at this. Arguably, I mean, it could have been 10,000 people. Getty says, or well, uh, international news agency said, it's about 160,000 people demonstrating in Barcelona on behalf of refugees, asking for more refugees, not the usual thing that we say, we don't want them, etc. right? And this is Barcelona, you know, I suppose sounds like a cosmopolitan place and all of that. E recently, even in a very tiny Italian town, people uh, came, came to the street, took to the street because they wanted the refugees, meaning the central Italian government wanted to relocate the refugees somewhere else. And these people in the small Italian town collected signatures and petitioned the authorities to keep their, their refugees there. Now, it's, again, it's not just about morality. There are also some financial incentives in hosting refugees in local communities. Um, but so there is this going on, and this is as true and as real and as you know realistic and pragmatic as the politician or the other citizen say, it's enough. I don't want any more <laughs> refugee, uh, enough of them. So um, it's a very special day in Italy. It's, you know, it's the, the Republic holiday. Uh, it's a big holiday. And, you know, this past year, it was characterized by this important um, demonstration 
um, again, bringing the border back into the uh, public sphere or public square. Um, the idea, pretty obviously, and of bringing the experience of solidarity that happens a lot where migrants and refugees are stranded, the experience of solidarity that happens a lot in coastal locations uh, and elsewhere, well, but also bringing it more you know, back to the attention of the public square and, square and of the public you know, sphere as well. And so this is just pretty random, uh, something I was involved with this past December, and here it's art, uh, arte migrante, migrant art, which I think really serves as a good reminder for us that ultimately migrant is uh, an adjective, a qualifier, an intersectional, so a little bit about feminism, right? Uh, it can be gender, race, religion, phenotype, but it's a you know intersectional mobilization. Um, and obviously, there's no you know pre-existing category of migrant, and arguably not even of refugee, you know, independent of whatever framework, uh, legal or political, etc. And ultimately, I do want to play, starting with myself, with what I say is the radical implication of human equality. Here again, I'm Italian, so I'm playing with etymologies, right? Radical roots crisis, critical. So, you know, at the end of the day, I think the roots of these very asymmetrical and entrenched and kind of given, like, naturalized system uh, of managing mobility and immobility, uh, well, okay, why, why is that? Uh, why, I mean, why are we doing this? Why are we perpetuating this? What justifies, ultimately, you know, that human and, if you want, the financial costs of this current system uh, and so all I'm you know envisioning all I'm asking you and everyone my fellow European citizens my students and my readers to do is really to think more about the criteria for inclusion and exclusion right so to get more of a democratic discussion started democratic and democratized right because the wall defense the Mediterranean is not a very democratic way to discuss things, right? And so, uh, you know, rather than outsourcing that decision to smugglers, traffickers, circumstance, the elements, discretion, and good luck, I think it's time to uh, talk more <laughs> about all of these, why it's happening, ways forward. Thank you. Should I moderate? Yeah. yeah, yeah. Please, please go ahead and speak up a little bit because um, we are being live streamed, so your questions can be heard and they can be picked up by the microphone. I think I need, you know, at the very least, to clarify a few things. I can go deeper. I can I can speak more explicitly both to gender and feminism. So you can test me if you want. Uh, yeah. In the back. Yeah. I just have um, so there are different questions. I'm a sociologist, and I just imagine myself doing a similar research, for example. So as a uh, port city, what kind of methodologies do you actually use in kind of uh, approaching, uh, you know, the population? Because you don't cannot e sending email, pre-arranging things, of course, right? So I just wondering methodology. Yeah. Maybe. Yeah. Essentially ethnographic in the sense of uh, having been around. Um, just so participant observation more even more than you know obviously interviews just by being there um, in this specific case uh, as I said it is my hometown and therefore I had access to both some of the people on Facebook uh, who were saying like even again um, that night but on Facebook meaning that in the comfort of their you know living room they were saying oh, yet another one it's enough whatever, and then, but I also knew that many others were actually going there uh, to help, to assist, because it is not an area that received, it did in the 90s, but not today, it does not receive, you know, a boat on a daily basis. So, um, so anyway, 
so that happened too, right? The, the people who go to the port to help out and the people who in the same town without suffering, you know, the cold of that night uh, in front of their, their metaphorical fireplace are complaining about you know, yet another, you know, wave or boat. Um, but yeah, participant observation a lot and some interviews. But also in this case, I was not physically there. Uh, my brother was there. My friends were there. Uh, the mayor was there. Uh, so I, then in, in the summer, uh, I did catch up with them. So your subject is not only refugees. You actually people in the Italian side. Yes. That, that's really important to me. I'm glad you know, sociologists brought it up. I think this a bit of the spirit also of mobility studies, and this is really important to me, is we don't study, I don't study immigrants. I don't study refugees themselves. I, of course, they're part of you know, all of this, but um, I think the focus needs to be much more uh, relational, you know, relations about, among, let's say, citizens and refugees. Uh, or you know civic engagement, or uh, again the, the political institutional framework, um, and of course you know refugee studies, for example, or other studies that focus more you know directly on refugees are perfect, perfectly legitimate. But it, yeah, it is not what what I do. Uh, um, yeah. Do you randomly selected the people? Like, do you focus on like NGO to be dedicated to you know? Uh, help out those people? Yes. Or, you know, how do you kind of selecting a sample? Yes. Well, I know, yeah, so far, that, you know, you made that, that doesn't go from sample kind of thinking, but I'm just wondering, how do you actually choose subjects? Subjects or, or, like or institutions? Like, yeah, people who kind of you could like observe. Because you want to know background of people, I'm sure, right? People who are, you know, who are kind of... Yes. Yeah. As I said, I think... Uh, as a political anthropologist, um, I don't go for you know um, like a sample in the sense of you know again how a sociologist um, I go about it. I tend to look more at key institutions or key um, key local actors, like key institutional actors or key NGO actors or you know again mayor. But also having said all of that. You do have to pay attention to, you know, the more spontaneous and informal yeah. civic uh, engagement, and obviously, in terms of observation, there is no way to plan for, you know, observing uh, boat landing or uh, all that. I mean, I did that in Lampedusa, where you know it was a boat landing almost daily, but uh, other things uh, I observed without almost wanting them, and indeed, you know, it was not in here. Um, I do build on my own existential and experiential, um, you know, story. I did wrote uh, an article on this. I also, as I said, grew up there, and in the 90s, it was an almost daily history of arrivals. So then, of course, in writing in the book specifically, I talk much more more about okay, what does it mean to be a scholar and at the same time uh, a citizen and an observer and a participant? Uh, yeah. Uh, in the back. <laughs> Sorry. Oh, <that's> <laughs> Cannot um, do names. <laughs> I'm Jean Lee. I'm in the English department. So I have two questions, and you can choose whichever one catches your fancy. The first one, um, you kind of pointed to sort of economic justifications as to why, you know, sending all this aid is more expensive than totally doable other policies. Why aren't we doing that? But then, like, throughout histi history, and even now, I'm just thinking, like, protecting whiteness, the prison industrial complex, colonization, empire, like, all these things were more expensive than they, you know, it, they were too expensive, in fact, and they didn't make us generate as much um, capital as we usually think that they must have. So I'm wondering, like, for you, what do you think are the reasons that these nations are so invested in uh, still in these in this conditional aid, rather than implementing perhaps other policies. Um, so maybe is it something about the visibility of the refugee as a figure? Um, I was wondering how you perhaps theorized about that. And then the second question is, please do tell us the difference between migrant and refugee and how you're using those distinctions. Because I, I studied multiply diasporic people, but um, you know, kind of yeah. intersecting with refugee studies. But 
are you using yeah I, I I do like both of them I think they're both important and maybe ironically maybe the first one is easier to answer from where I stand than the second the first one I'm glad you know the audience or you brought this up because I I do believe um, it does boil down to ideology or ideologies, not as in leftist or right ideologies, but ideologies that, um, you know, believe that we take for granted or that those politicians take for granted that are pretty much uh, racial and or racialized or they, ha they have to do, that have to do with, um, I don't like the term Islamophobia, but, you know, anti-Islamic feelings or presumptions they have to do with the idea that, you know, going back to my second slide or first slide, it is natural, it's only natural that countries such as Lebanon with, you know, a recent, relatively recent history of civil war, sectarianism, demographic issues and, and whatever, hosts at the very least one million, so the country's about th three, four million, but, you know, like one in three people is a Syrian refugee. That's normal, that's natural. They're used to it. They're the same people, whatever. And it's somehow unnatural for any European country to receive whether the one million people in Germany or the 100,000 or 15,000 uh, or whatever that is, right? So, and that's purely ideological in the sense of, uh, once again, not really thinking through all of these uh, empirically or in the from the point of view of feasibility, but you know, taking for granted that, okay, when people arrive or when people land or when people are rescued, we need to put them in um, uh, confinement in, you know, into facilities, into, which are not just shelters, are also detention and processing facilities, right? Uh, why is that precisely? Uh, that's new, right? And in the, in the book, I do trace the origin of this idea of the, the camp, of the containment approach. Right? Why does it, have, does it have to be, I mean, the mayor Lampedusa is this tiny island south of Sicily, it is part of Italy, uh, and the mayor of Lampedusa at some point said, well, we have, you know, everyone has a second and third home uh, for summer or for tourists, you know, bed and breakfast, all of that. Why is it that we need a camp for the newly arrived refugees when we have all of these houses? And again, uh, it's about ideology, meaning that Okay, we've been doing this since the 1990s. People arrive, we detain them. So, you know, we just keep doing that. Um, we have been, or we perceive ourselves as Europeans as mostly white. So that's who we are. And, okay, where is it written? Who says so? And how did you come up with white, uh, you know, in Europe? So you take things for granted. You take for granted that you've been dealing with Gaddafi, the authoritarian Libyan leader over the last few years before his demise. And so you just do that with the new leaders, right? What's, what is there to think about that? It's all natural. So, um, okay, that was the first one. The second one, I do s think that the uh, most general word is migrants. Uh, I do, um, I do, I'm not convinced Okay, I am convinced of the fact that when, irrespective of multiple motives uh, that people have, or irrespective of the kind of violence, persecution, or lack of protection uh, that they leave behind or want to leave behind, once they get through this process, once they get through the kind of you know process you saw for uh, Filmon in the Sinai, or simply getting through. Libya and the desert and also Niger and the Mediterranean and going through the smugglers and occasionally through the traffickers, you are actually a refugee. Uh, you should be, at the very least, be granted temporary humanitarian protection. Um, but having said all of that, um, so I think this is the case. Um, but I don't want to just say refugees because I do also believe that it, it, it's really not that simple to simply say, okay, refugees can stay, which is what's going on in Europe and also here, refugees to a degree, to a lesser degree. Refugees can stay, everyone else will, will deport, 
we will deport people to Afghanistan, like Germany insta intends to do and is doing with people, again, back to Afga Afghanistan. Uh, we can deport people to a lot of countries where, again, there is no active war. Maybe there is no active persecution, but there is corruption, con connivances, inability to legitimately make a living. So, and I do not want to participate to just categorizing those people as immigrants or economic migrants, but I still believe that there is something about, you know, the, uh, the mobility idea that warrants using migrants for everyone. Uh, yeah, so anyway, um, I have much more, but uh, I think there was somebody here first, no? Okay, you and then. No, we're not trafficked. We're not trafficked, okay. Um, so kind of choosing to disidentify with, the, with this kind of narrative of just a poor migrant, you know, something to, to feel pity for. How did, did they identify? Um, was, did they take on the kind of um, identity of the, the, the refugee, or yeah. was it something else? Yeah, refugees, definitely. But not, a, but not, you know, definitely not ready to just be submissive, and just definitely trying to keep a sense of uh, autonomy and dignity and agency and, um, and just really maybe often going back to the methodological question, um, the very challenging indirectly without saying anything the very idea that most people have of the refugee, right? So the refugee, to be a refugee, you don't have to be poor, and you don't have to be, uh, you know, that's not related to being, or being recognized as, as a refugee. Um, and, and, and the, and, but there is such a misunderstanding that in Italy, among other places, when people see a refugee who's wearing some, whatever, Nike or branded shoes and has, you know, a better smartphone, than they have, then they say, oh, these are not real refugees. Again, no, not related. And so, uh, you know, as a social scientist, I do have to be kind of truthful about this. Uh, again, being a refugee is not about being poor or being morally deserving or conforming to whatever expectation there is uh, about, you know, refugees being needy. Yeah, there, you know, there's a legal category, which is pretty black and white about who is a refugee, and it's not about this. Uh, ultimately, it's about morality and how people make moral arguments about, you know, others. Uh, but, uh, so, yeah, people themselves, you know, they do not challenge the refugee identity, but they don't want it to be conflated with this passivity and, you know, neediness and kind of you know, this kind of begging idea that the others ascribe uh, onto them. Uh, yeah. Yeah, but thank you. Um, I, I was wondering, if, I mean, you mentioned Kazi Garati uh, in one of your slides, and uh, you know, we all know what happened in Libya and how uh, the French government and, uh, you know, the Americans and, and other European powers were involved in, in, in destroying, in, you know, in the demand. So I, I was wondering if we want to read all of what's happening right now and integrate it with as a legacy of colonialism. I mean, I don't know if I, I mean, you might not be, uh, this might not be a part of your research, but I was wondering yeah. if you could speak to that. Um, like, I forgot to add something to the question, I forgot your name, but English, uh, right? I thought it was important that you raise the question rather than myself, you know, more directly of, okay, racism and, you know, the history of Islamophobia and the re history of, you know, whatever white supremacism being essentially reproduced even at, you know, financial cost. Uh, so the audience rather than me, right? So that it, it almost emerges from you rather than me telling you, right? And I think this is a similar case. I think those asymmetrical relationships of conditional aid where the other country 
I mean, can the government of Afghanistan realistically say no to conditional aid from Germany or the European Union? No, right? So they have to comply. Can the government of Niger say no to aid from the European Union? They, they cannot, right? Um, and so then I'm not necessarily interested in defining the, myself the relationship as neo-colonial or as a you know, form of colonialism because I think that, again, you're as citizens as I am. You are, well, you're an historian, so you can do that arguably better than you know, myself and uh, in your own terms. Uh, the history of colonialism, uh, just as you, know, you did for, for race and racism, uh, so the history of colonialism here, I think it's related not so much directly. I mean, you could go into, okay, how come you know, Italy and France are so invested into the energy sector in Libya? And you know, the Italian multinational oil corporation has a preferential access in Libya. And indeed, it, it could have been the, fa you know, the fact that France was a bit jealous or wanted more uh, you know, uh, access to oil in Libya. Anyway, that's some theories. But you know, it is a fact that, for example, uh, France again uh, extracts uh, uranium in Niger, uh, or that you know, again, Italian oil companies extract oil in Nigeria. And it's not so much about you know, Nigerian people or people in Niger getting their fair share. It's that, obviously, somebody is in Niger and in Nigeria is benefiting from those investments. But you know, which proportion of the society in Niger and Nigeria? So there is an unequal distribution also internally that you know, it's not colonialism per se, but you know, historically there are some parallels. Somebody was benefiting during colonial times, right? Somebody was collaborating more than others. Uh, and so you, know, you might see for example, in aggregate terms, you know, GDP for, for whether Nigeria going up and all that, but what's the actual, um, you know, civic, economic, social progress at the local level? It, so um, anyway, that's part of the answer. And I don't believe that, for example, between Eritrea or Ethiopia and Italy, there is, you know, um, kind of a migration related to colonialism, uh, although. For example, Eritrea, Eritreans in Rome, well, the first generations did not end up in Rome as students or whatever out of the blue, right? There were ties, and as all kind of ties, they did result in some migration and then in additional migration. Uh, so th that, yeah, that's part of the answer in different ways, I believe. Um, maybe Marco as a student and then the faculty member. Uh, the short answer is no, because nothing in you know in historical developments is automatic and kind of necessary in this line of you know it's guaranteed. Uh, much of it is perceptions and representations, and you know Hungary. Uh, I mean, migration is part of the issue, but they actually are not really receiving refugees, right? So, um, so I do believe. First of all, that the you know based on some quantitative surveys, uh, more or less over the last few years, kind of it's it's almost constant, uh, you know, give and take. European civil or uh, European uh, borders constituencies are kind of div divided, uh, almost evenly, evenly, right? About the people demonstrating for, and the people complaining against. 
And so, um, so again, there's nothing necessary, there's nothing irreversible. I think, um, uh, in, I think that it, you know, this can be a very complex and also country specific uh, analysis, but you know, indeed, if there is no one challenging uh, the more simplistic, easy to propagate and easy to absorb discourses about immigration, refugees, the costs, right? If there is no one challenging, then yeah, perhaps. But is there anyone challenging? So if a centrist or moderate government uh, you know, insists every day on the idea and the trope of curbing refugee arrivals, right? that's a centrist political force, then, okay, who's challenging uh, the right wing, right? Or if no one ever mentions, you know, the aging factors, labor issues, the costs of border enforcement, uh, I, I am convinced that even if these numbers were to stay constant and the same, well, if somebody actually mentioned those things, maybe at least as a conversation, it could go forward, but no one really is. And finally, uh, no one is really mentioning that, that the idea or the, the fact that, okay, you have, let's say, 150,000 people on average arriving in this way, kind of surviving the Mediterranean on a yearly basis in Italy, but also you know, Greece, Spain, etc. Well, why do they have to arrive to in this way? through this channel, because you know those people are not, I mean, from a sovereign or national, whatever point of view, they're not going to be deported or repatriated or sent back. They're gonna stay uh, in the country, in, in Europe. So why isn't, again, anyone saying anything about, okay, could the same actual, the same or higher or lower, whatever, but you know, could there be more labor? So, but, so it's not just about you know the numbers per se, it's, yes, the representation, but also, again, the ideology that does not allow, that does not really allow or, or make room for asking those questions. Thank you. Um, I was going to ask you something about the relation between Italy and the EU uh, in terms of the, like, creating all this, like, border regime and border enforcement and everything. Now, there's an interesting situation with the Europeanization of the borders, right? Now, on the one hand, these borders are national borders of Italy, but actually they are not because they are European borders. And the EU gives the role to control the European borders to Italy. And that control also means uh, basically buying border technology produced by certain uh, companies. And they are really like a few of them. These are like I mean, giant uh, transnational corporations. So. Especially with the new like expanded mandate of Frontex, the EU will have the right to intervene in any country if they are not cooperating with the EU. So like I wonder like what you think about like um, the EU Italy relations because when we talk about Europe, it's not actually a homogeneous Europe. Like the Greece, Italy, Spain, yeah. their position is very yeah, a lot, lot going on there, um, and it, it is. It happens to be the case that some of those uh, companies are actually Italian. Uh, exactly. Yeah. Okay, yeah. You're very well informed, <laughs> and therefore, you know what what works, what maybe doesn't work for some Italian citizens. Whatever they, I am unemployed, and these are coming, but it does work for fin, fin mechanica, right? For these, you know, military or semi-military, uh, even semi-public companies. So, um, and I feel the same, the same applies to the larger role of Italy to the Greece, Spain and Greece uh, in being, you know, the southern border of the European Union, meaning that there have been, you know, media and, and uh, judiciary inquiry, inquiries into uh, people, Italian citizens, Italian uh, kind of NGOs, making a profit, huge profits on the back of the refugees. So instead of you know giving that pocket money to refugees, well, it's in their pockets. So they are benefiting, right? Uh, same for you know the um, a little bit the navy, the, the like military navy, the coast guard, 
the um, here uh, customs and excise, you know, tax police kind of they all got new vessels, new helicopters, new technology, and so they they're fine with that. You know, it's not really an issue for that for them. Uh, of course, you do have the Dublin system, and that's that can get very complicated in that. Okay, how is it possible that so many people arrive in Italy and so many people? reach other countries. In theory, Italian authorities should, as I said, detain and fingerprint and do that with all of them. But you know, going back to migrant refugee agency, what do you do when the refugee from Syria or Afghanistan or elsewhere either you know, burn their own uh, fingerprints or, or really resist this uh, sort of <coughs> So, you know, what the European Union and the Northern European countries ask of Italy and Greece, how do you actually accomplish this, even if you want to? And not to say that a few times uh, it does look, you know, the Italian police and authorities turn a blind eye. So just like Gaddafi and Erdogan occasionally, again, migrants are used as, you know, negotiation team for whatever, so, you know, you're either, yeah, or we, So thank you for the academic story you told, but I think some of the most compelling points I saw in your slides um, were the artist images. So who are these artists? Are they part of the migrant community? And what has their impact? Yeah. Well, thank you. I mean, there, there is a point in using uh, art and migrant art and all of that. So um, yeah, there, there is a lot of premises that also on the US-Mexico border um, and in the US, there's a lot of art that is either using materials you know, from the border or using themes from you know, migration, or it's, it can be migrant art themselves. So here, with two artists, thank you, <laughs> better, so I don't have to shout. Um, we had one artist who's just um, an Italian artist feeling that, as many other uh, Italian artists feeling that he really needed to represent, convey, after a lot of thinking that there was Francesco Piobigi, right? Thinking that you have to, I mean, that you cannot not pay attention to what's going on in your you know, backyard um, as a citizen before than as an artist, which kind of re also reflects what I think as a citizen and as an anthropologist. Uh, second, um, and obviously that artist, you know, spent time in Lampedusa, in Sicily, et cetera, et cetera. The other ones, again, were people um, who went through um, uh, the Sinai mostly and, and, and Sudan, and mostly they were Eritrean and some, some Somali, uh, maybe some Ethiopian nationals, and they was collected by uh, the Jesuit refugee services um, and, um, and, you know, many of them were people who were in situations of protracted um, displacement, meaning that it's not people leaving Eritrea necessarily, but people who were already born in refugee camps uh, in, in East Africa. And then, you know, rather, again, rather than waiting in this limbo, uh, feeling the urge or need or, in, you know, motivation of uh, going north. Uh, impact, um, I think it's the one million dollar question um, in that it's, it's, it's a different one, you know, not only I don't have, you know, uh, data on, okay, how does ex being ex exposed to art or to, you know, the compelling migrant story or the compelling, you know, visual representation may change uh, attitudes. I am convinced that very often, I mean, there's a lot of evidence on the following, which is 
people who do have pretty much a set belief in the opportunity, whether to build a wall or to prevent additional migration, they're not going to change opinion. So even when faced with the evidence, um, people, again, because to a degree of ideology or whatever, they're likely to hold on to the pre-existing beliefs. So, um, so then, you know, that's an interesting question for academics, for artists, who is your public, who is your, who, who are you addressing? Um, but anyway, having said all of that, I do agree. I mean, uh, a piece of poetry, a piece of art, uh, a photograph, a single migrant story might be, well, it's of course more effective than the academic <laughs> rendering or, you know, might be more, definitely more effective than whatever the numbers or the aggregate data or, or you know. So it is effective, uh, it works, it conveys something as real, as empirical, as, you know, reliable. Uh, but then the question is, do people follow up on that knowledge, right? So then we move on to another question, right? I think we might be done, but you know, we, we all saw the children dying on the, uh, on the coast. We all saw, you know, Ailan and, and many other people, and we all knew that, okay, the family from Syria, they were supposed to reunite with family in Canada. We all knew they were from Syria. I mean, it, and Kurds, right, doesn't get more legitimate than, than that as a good reason for family reunification and flying, you know, legally to Canada, and yet we keep reinforcing or not challenging the whole system that does not allow a refugee to, you know, essentially get on a plane and, and, and fly to Canada uh, legally, right, or the US or Italy, etc. So, and we have the knowledge, we have the drama, we have the reality, we have the evidence, but, right? That's a great question. I do believe that there is, um, there is an effort to understand the root causes. Um, they are very often conceptualized in terms of uh, development, um, like economic, financial development, employment opportunities, um, and all of that. But it, it is arguably a bit shallow in terms of, in terms of lack of understanding that, as I was saying earlier, you might have growth, you might have some development, you might have whether well, some companies, you might have some, some uh, you know, economic progress, but having said that, that does not necessarily uh, curb migration. So um, at, to me, that's a bit, um, I, I don't think somehow, uh, European officials and, and whoever, you know, deals with migration issues uh, outside of, you know, some scholarship have really realized that, okay, development in the short term might actually mean more migration or a different kind of migration. So, so yeah, it's this idea that we, we help develop them and then they stay put, which empirically is not true, at least in the medium short term. Second, again, it's kind of, so it's kind of, again, kind of a conditional development or in the sense of development with, you know, this purpose. Second, uh, there's no understanding, in my opinion, and I'm not the only one, of course, that um, this unequal development or cooperation with authoritarian figures or the corruption are really good reasons for, for leaving meaning they're not taken as seriously as other reasons. And, you know, obviously, I mean, it's not that Europeans or American or whatever can do a lot in terms of, you know, how do you facilitate 
uh, democratic, democratic civic uh, growth uh, in countries sending migrants? How do you fix some you know, structural issues? But at the very least, once again, I think they could do more uh, toward, well, not exacerbating uh, the root causes. I would argue a lot of this is actually exacerbating some of the root causes. Uh, and even if it's marketed or understood as development. Sorry, that's kind of a convoluted answer, but I hope it does bring out some of the complexities of, um, yeah, the root causes and, and the development um, issues. Um, all of you, oh, well, let's start from, yeah, the back first and then, yeah. Okay, um, well, you spoke a lot about morality and ideology mm -hmm. and how a lot of people are convicted in what they believe. Um, but do you believe that somehow through um, some type of moral suasion, even though it may not be the art that we see in your slides or the poems, if there is a way that some story is going to be able to get through to people who aren't on coast, who aren't dealing with it, and who might not understand the complexity of situations that refugees from Syria or from your African countries that you're speaking of that cross the Mediterranean Sea? And do you think that there's a way to educate them more, whether it be um, through truth in the news or truth at, in academia where they go to school, truth in communicating with people in their towns? Is there just a way that the truth can actually get out and how people can actually understand and maybe question their own beliefs, question their government, and question everything that's happening? Okay, I'll try. Thank you. You only, you only ask great questions uh, at the college of. I won't <laughs> even try the second part. <laughs> but um, so the short answer is yes, I do believe, I do agree for, you know, with the urgency and need of, of an opportunity of doing all of those, all of those, um, you know, from education, from, you know, changing the curriculum in, in schools uh, in Europe and arguably in some schools here, uh, you know, in terms of how we teach about Europe, the colonial history, the repression, the role of the Mediterranean Sea, and question all of that. But I've been doing this, and I've been paying attention to all of these for years. And I, I used to, every, you know, after every shipwreck, major one especially, uh, after every death, I used to think, okay, now, I mean, they've seen it, not just the citizens, especially the policymakers. They've seen it. I mean, they see the consequences of what they're doing they will change course. And instead, again, I developed the very idea of crimes of peace, borrowing from an Italian scholar, um, to insist on the perpetuation of a system, right? That we know it's not working for everyone, or at least for those people, right? So, um, so now uh, I'm much more convinced of the idea to, yes, debate, discuss, talk, engage others, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. But I'm, I'm also um, a bit convinced of the need and indeed opportunity to come to terms with the conflictual nature of modern contemporary societies. Meaning, I don't get, I don't need, or you don't need to convince of the truthfulness and opportunity of something. 100% of the population. I mean, as long as you get 50%, maybe plus one, that's good enough. And I think uh, accepting that the conflict in society and in economics and whatever exists, and that some make a profit and others do not, and maybe trying to you know, answer maybe to those in society who do not necessarily make a profit out of migration and paying attention to their concerns, uh, might be more effective than trying to, you know, convince or morally, uh, moral, you know, moral suasion or moral kind of conviction. So, yeah, I think dealing with the conflict might be more effective than trying to convince. Uh, although that does not exclude, 
you know, the sharing inf reliable information and stories and art and data and, yeah. Uh, I guess the professor. Yes, uh, if you could please speak more, uh, thank you for the presentation, uh, about the gender and intersectional elements. Uh, yeah. Uh, yeah. All of all of the above. So I'll start from the short one. Um, so in for most of my work, it's been a combination of it, English, uh, some Italian. For you know people like Benjamin, for example, uh, they they learn Italian by the state when I talk with, interview them. Uh, some a mi small you know chat in French. Um, some Slavic languages, because again, not all migrants or refugees come from stereotypical uh, places, a few words in Arabic, so that, you know, Spanish, but not that helpful. Uh, anyway, combination of these and occasionally some translators um, that, that I do prefer uh, not to have a translator uh, if possible. And in terms of the, in, well, intersectional um, uh, qualities here, I think uh, it is one of the ways forward, one of the ways to show and, well, start talking about, you know, the so-called plight of migrants, not just being the plight of migrants, but really being uh, uh, a condition that is intersectionally relevant to either we conceptualize them as segments of societies uh, or um, minorities more generally, or you know, the idea of the need to reconceptualize what individual countries or the European Union as a whole are in terms of plurality or homogeneity. So uh, I know it's not you know the classical sense of maybe intersectional, as in again, feminism is a bit more, or over there in the American sense, is a bit more lit literal, right? It's different. Um, again, segments or, or, or groups in society um, in complex, you know, urban or post-industrial post societies that are facing challenges for whom, you know, the border, the system, the crimes of peace are not quite working, for whom uh, even citizenship is not really giving them, you know, these great privileges. Uh, and therefore, that I think that the, the necessary uh, other qualifier is how I'm using uh, citizenship, right? It's not just the citizens, those with a piece of paper, it's much more those who are civically involved. And so those might be very often, uh, yes, citizens in the le legal sense, but also the migrants and refugees, their children, so-called second generations, could be documented, undocumented, immigrant as in economic or as refugees, and they all, again, maybe especially in the Italian context, for example, I'm thinking of, you know, some labor issues or some mobilizations again, against, um, yeah, well, exploitation uh, on the workplace or, you know, um, we have huge problems in terms of farm labor, farm exploitation in the south of Italy, and it was not citizens revolting against that, um, it was migrants, uh, even if historically citizens have, have also been suffering that exploitation. Or, you know, a few years ago, revolting against organized crime um, it was not citizens. It was migrant farm workers who were not being paid. And to me, that's an international, sorry, int well, maybe international too, but intersectional civic struggle or uh, engagement. of refugees in the media, both dehumanized and humanized. And I was curious if you, um, during your time working with refugees, have come across any museum exhibition, film, art piece that really stuck with you and kind of either changed your perception you felt was super profound in communicating refugee narratives or not convincing people, but kind of communicating the depth. Yeah. Um, wow. So, well, I'll mention maybe a couple that are, not advertisement, but 
Netflix, uh, since you might have access to it, you know. Um, they, they, the one really famous, I think, also in the US and at the European level is uh, Fire at Sea by this uh, prominent Italian you know, documentary director. Um, I watch it, of course, photography. I mean, all of I, I am into movies and documentaries and you know the photography and the quality and the whatever, the how things are assembled, all that is important and in this case, you know, it's beautiful. But then, you know, I did ask a few people in Lampedusa, which is where it was shot, okay, so what do you think about it? And yeah, they, they, you know, it goes back to, okay, how do you collect your interviews or, you know, how do you decide whom? And they were quite critical of the, you know, a bit of a emphasis just on the rescue aspect, on the humanitarian aspect. Um, by the Italian Navy and others, but you know, if you don't show what happens before that or the larger context, then is that good enough beyond the aesthetics? And so, in terms of analysis, right, and in terms of well, political implications. So, so anyway, that could be one. But I think I do agree that it's a bit limited and limiting, especially for people who just see already in the what are newer times the images and the. Okay, there's the rescue. Okay, they're not. There's not so bad after all. Uh, one, I think that that captured more of the trajectory uh, across, you know, West Africa a little bit, and then Sicily, and uh, also the uh, farm labor exploitation was uh, Mediterranean. Mediterranean. Uh, there was also on Netflix, and uh, he is Mediterranean with the final A. He's an Italian American. Um, Director, obviously not really known or recognized in Italy, uh, had the movie document. No, sorry, movie produced in the U.S. Um, you know, I, I at another panel and also Notre Dame, uh, we had Human Flaw uh, by Ai Weiwei. I still have to watch it. I only watched the first one hour, and then the panel people at the previous panel decided, okay, that's enough. It was already 9 p.m. So anyway, it's very long. But so I cannot, you know, speak to that. But I do, I mean, I Weiwei, way, okay, we know, you know, <laughs> uh, big figure, or background, or, but, you know, human flow, I, sorry, flow, right? Um, I, I always say this is not a flow, this is not, why, right? I mean, let alone invasion or, you know, wave, but to me, it does boil down to migrant is a qualifier, um, human, of course, but flow, I don't think there is enough, you know, um, recognition of the, whatever, individual stories, motives, w irrespective of the documentary. I'm just talking about, you know, the, uh, the rhetorical trope of the flow, right? Cur you can say stemming the flow, curbing the flow, which is the language of mainstream politics. Um, and, and also, you know, the, anyway, I can go on and on, but I think some, some, there some legitimate issues should you put a refugee in front of the camera and the refugee, you know, is distressed as a result of your intervention. At least in anthropology, I know that I'm not supposed to contribute to the stress of the person, not even for a good cause, right? For a documentary and this has, you know, millions of viewers might be different, but it, it's a tough call. Um, in terms of, yeah, representation too. Um, yes. Uh, yeah, I just was thinking that rather than flows or even intersectional qualifiers, I was struck by sort of, you know, in some of your papers where you kept going back to the metaphor of the sea and its liquid. And so maybe, maybe there's something there. Maybe it's less so categorical groups of categories, and maybe it's something more, I don't know, liquid. <laughs> yeah. <laughs> I think, you know, the, the liquid uh, is both, uh, I think, a brief reference. It comes from an article of mine. Both, uh, you know, maybe quick reference to Bauman, the sociologist, and, you know, the whole liquid of modernity, uh, without celebration, though, because, again, does not really work for you know for everyone for those thirty thousand for those families left behind, but coming back, I think 
is my more you know newer work and hopefully uh, a new book. Uh, sovereignty in Europe again going back to ideology. Sovereignty is about land, right? Sovereignty is about the soil. Sovereignty is also about this idea that you can fence the sea in some way. There was uh, one of I think. Uh, an Austrian minister, who is now the prime minister, saying at some point a couple of years ago, well, we need to do in the Mediterranean what we did uh, in southeastern Europe. I mean, the, in southeastern Europe, we got the fences going. Now we need to do this in the Mediterranean, right? So, okay, uh, obviously not in a, in a literal sense, you know, not sure what they meant. Uh, I can come back to the technicalities of, you know, interception at sea and all of that, um, the capsizing. And, but I th having said all of that, I think this, so the Mediterranean, uh, what I would argue, you know, European governments are trying to do is to use the Mediterranean as, well, a boundary between, as, you know, this separation between Europe in a very Eurocentric way, uh, Africa, and Asia or the Middle East, right? Where these peninsulas and or land masses ever segregated historically? I, I don't think so, right? I, historians might correct me. So, so then that's one layer. The second layer is perhaps the, you know, uh, well, inability of the Mediterranean Sea to be constrained to be claimed as their own by any one party or nation or religious group, right? It's, you know, we used to call it in the ancient Roman Empire and during fascism, our sea, right? Today, that cannot be realistically accomplished by everyone. I mean, ISIS in Libya, they tried to, you know, capture some coastal cities, um, Oil companies, they try to carve, you know, their drilling and whatever trade spaces. The military, NATO uh, countries, you know, like to control their own fishing and search and rescue areas. In reality, it's the sea. And one really important thing for me as I'm thinking about the sea and infrastructures at sea and all of these, that the sea is not still. The sea is continuously moving. And it literal, literally carries people, um, you know, uh, in their movement. Uh, and, and so, what, you know, then in more pr productive terms, can the sea help us, not, I mean, scholars, but also citizens, politicians, toward a rethinking of what does Europe mean? What does a country mean? What does sovereignty mean? in the 21st century? What is a border in the 21st century at this time of mobility and, and you know, all, again, the trade, the circulation, the exploitation, whatever that goes on in the Mediterranean? So yeah, that's a great question, again. We'll, we'll end on that because it's 9.20 and I'm mindful of the time. Some people have a long drive home. So uh, thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you.